Save a lot or save a little. There's no difference when you hop in the car with the wrong person. Stay rural or go into the city. There is no safe place to hide. You'll end up a body on the side of the road. Nameless bones lying on the grounds and in the creeks picked apart by animals and time may be your fate. As a little-known killer drives the streets and the highways looking for his prey, we're close to Halloween and it's time to get ghoulish as we delve into Fox Hollow Farm and Herbert Bowmeister. I didn't see you there. Something big is going on here. From hunting ghosts to Bigfoot. Paranormal, UFOs, true crime, and more. We won't just be spouting articles. I was researching for your entertainment. The beginning of a new world. <laughs> the best guac you'll ever fucking eat. True story. It's basically like one day you walk outside and you see that the ants are playing with matches. This, this is, is the Black Hat Report. Report. See you on the other side. Cool name. You get the a Herbert Life now? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I thought it was going to be Herbert like an Death. MLM scheme. <laughs> Should have been Herbert Death, but... Ooh. Welcome to the Black Cat Report in episode 68. I'm your host, Joey, and with me is Gil. Hello, hello. And Betsabe. Hi. She's returning from her recent sabbatical. So, today, we're going to start our two-part series on Herbert Bowmeister and the Fox Hollow Farm. As we were in spooky season, we wanted to go through at least part of some horror. Well, to be fair, it's all horror, murders and hauntings. So, <laughs> right? So, two weeks ago, we released the last part of our series on the Benders, a serial killer frontier family. All those people murdered way back when, and then, well, most likely the Benders probably got away with it, which was what me and Gil figured that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I've been this awfully week... suspicious of the uh, Bender family grow cry that's like I saw pop up down the street, but... I don't think it's related. Ah, that shouldn't be. You should probably just go spend the night. Yeah. Probably a nice little Airbnb. Yeah. <laughs> this week, we're going to start with Herbert Bowmeister and his story before we get into the hauntings for next week's episode. Also, if you have a spooky story, please send it to us via our email, contact at blackcat.report, or you can send it via our Instagram. You can send it as audio or as text, and we can read it later. This will be for our special Halloween episode. Well... Yeah, pretty much the special Halloween episode. So please send it in to us. We're excited to hear them. Yes. I do want to also say before, as I didn't give them last week, the main source for this episode is going to be The Horrors of Fox Hollow Farm by Richard Estep with Robert Graves, and also a few other websites that will be listed in the show notes. Also, before we hop into the story, I have to give a huge, huge, huge shout out to... Miller's Monsters, who gave us an excellent review on his TikTok and on his Instagram and on all of his social medias. And, um, well, just a huge welcome from all of us here to anybody that's come over that way. And thanks. Now let's get back to the story. Herbert Bowmeister was born in Indianapolis, Indiana on April 7th, 1947. He was the oldest kid to his parents, anesthesiologist Dr. Herbert Eugene Bowmeister and Elizabeth Bowmeister, nay Schmidt. And yes, I think I said it correctly, nay Schmidt. Throughout his adolescence, he was described as a just a little weird and antisocial. A story with one of his teachers told of him while he was young, he put a dead crow on her desk as a gift just to see wow. her reaction. And Gil, I know you're pissed about this because he took another soldier from your crow <laughs> army. I'm your brother. Yeah. And well, Miss Robert. Oh, Robert Crow. Yeah, well, that's fucked up. Yeah, it's pretty messed up, right? But wait, is there, I just want to make sure we're not leaving an important part out. Was she a taxidermist? Mm, I don't think so. I think she was that just a teacher. Like, that would have made sense. That would have been a great that gift. That would have been yeah, a gift. that would have been yeah. act, a fantastic gift. Yeah. Very thoughtful gift. gift. Yeah, he's, he's like, here's context. Cheryl Crow, you know? Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, okay. speaking about being pissed... He was actually noted as having urophilia or urinaglia, which are very hard words to say. Which, to be fair, if you like this, good on you. Not my place to judge of what color of shower you like, especially if it's a rich one. So let me explain this if you didn't get it. He is into did golden not showers. Get it. Ew. He likes being peed on. No. Yes. Or, why? I mean, I'm not going to kink shame. Yeah, I mean, but... like, good on him. Like, if that's what he likes. Yeah. Wait, how old is he? At this yeah, point, wait, he's like yeah, that early. Is... He's like twelve. He's like that's twelve or thirteen weird. at this point. I can't... Okay. Damn. 
Okay. How was it documented? That's just so in the... weird to think about that. Like a kid. Like he, he was very yeah. he asked about it a lot and he was like real into it. And there's there's an instance later that we'll get into that it was when he gets older that you're kinda like, Oh, I'm only making fun weird. of him here because he's a serial killer. We know that, but yeah. I do picture him coming home. Mommy, how come all the men get mad when I lean under them at the urinals? <laughs> 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 And it's a crime. <laughs> they never complain on Sundays at church. Oh, Anyways, right? <laughs> oh yeah, but that's true holy water right there. Oh, well, my God. <laughs> oh. well, his father and mother noticed Anyways. that he was having a few problems in school. <laughs> well, obviously, and with his psyche, really? so they gave him a psych evaluation. But let's say this is a psych evaluation test from like the 1950s, 1960s. So let's take this with a grain of salt. But it did lead to an evaluation of young Herbert having schizophrenia. You've got the wackawoo hysteria. (laughs) Yeah, the wackawoo hysteria. (laughs) And I do believe a lot of times people that didn't necessarily have the what's diagnosed as schizophrenia were diagnosed as schizophrenic. And they may have had something like uh, multiple personality disorder, which is a little different or might have just had some other problems that maybe something could have fixed real easily um, or just, you know, it's yeah. part of it. It's, it was part of the 50s, 60s, and 70s to just diagnose horribly. And then, oh, yeah, cool, that's you. Let's put you in a bathtub and shock you. <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> you know what I was thinking the problem was? The front half of your brain. How about you just come over here real quick? <laughs> just... Let me put a spike in it. <laughs> uh, let me lobotomy. Yeah, <laughs> that was huge. So actually was yep. pretty huge all the way up until 2000, I think. Pretty, it was pretty yeah. normal. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, well, during high school, Herbert had trouble fitting in, hence the antisocial behavior comment earlier. The high school he attended, North Central High in Indianapolis, was known for sports. And like, well, one third of this podcast can relate. I'm looking at you, Gil, because me and Betsabe <laughs> played a lot of sports in high school. He was not oh. a sportly fella. No, no. No, no. Picture how much I chain smoke, like playing sports. Yeah. <laughs> well, me and Betsy Bay both <laughs> played terrible. high school sports. We both played tennis, and we're really good at it. So we were. Yeah, we were the best. Though. <laughs> yep. We were well, number one. Still looking at you, Gil. And we're all he sitting not... here together today. <laughs> yep. And we all. <laughs> no difference. <laughs> well, to be fair, it sounds like a lot of people that listen to this podcast doesn't really, you know, doesn't you know, part of that. So it doesn't really add into his future endeavors because he just wasn't a sporty guy. He was actually really small and really, really skinny. And a lot of people had this, you know, they were just like, that's your, when he gets married, they looked at him and they're like, that's your husband? I'm just and it was a just kind of this weird I need thing. some water. Yeah, which is kind of yeah. sad. He was, he was like not a horrible person at this time. He was just a young kid that just didn't fit in. So a lot of smart people do start out with, you know, and successful people start out like this. They weren't good at sports in the high school, so they figured other ways to get there, you know, to make it are like you, that. So, are you like I'm opening ju- I'm, up to us right now? No, I was are good we at talking sports. About Gil now? I, we're all talking about Gil. You can always open up to us and tell us about your, your horrible high school days. Not oh, on this podcast, dude, uh, maybe oh. afterwards. Yeah, we'll get into it afterwards. So, just gonna, just gonna tease me like that, okay? Can, yeah, that well, fun. it's gonna be part of your Halloween horror story episode, so. Yeah. <laughs> so then when my parents saw my report card. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna make a joke, but it is horrifying, so I am <laughs> done. In 1965, after high school, he attended Indiana University. He wanted to follow in his father's footsteps, so he started studying anatomy, which might be a little clue to his future. While he was there, he met his future wife, Juliana Sater. And after a year, he decided, eh, college was not for me. And I want to yeah. compare this because this sounds more like me, but I did leave college after two years. But I was just like, <laughs> after two years, I was like, eh, this is just not for me. I, I can't, I don't want to do this. So in 1967, he returned to Indianapolis and got a job working at the Indianapolis Star, which is the local big oldest newspaper in Indianapolis. And he was noted by his fellow co-workers as being very efficient and always well-dressed. That man there, he's very efficient, always well-dressed. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> like, like a pee most of the time, though, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's his job as a bathroom attendant. 
Exactly. Oh well, God. he wrote for him, though. He didn't just work there. His dad helped you know, him we, get that we job. We have an actual desk. But no, this is fine. I have bathroom problems. I'm just going to work here. And <laughs> But you're like under me while I'm on the toilet. Nope. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> oh, how did I get here? Yeah, he was trying to take the golden parachute, though. Not the golden, you know, show. Anyways, in Half of the research for this episode was done on a dark area of Pornhub that Joey is now trying to hide from the government. <laughs> I watched a lot of documentaries to fix this. And next week, I will watch a lot more documentaries to get us into the mood for the sure, spookiness. Documentaries. Let me tell you, Robocop 69 was not the sequel to Robocop. Yeah. Duchess, the cat that's staying here, was judging me very harshly while I was watching the documentaries. Well, I'll go ahead and move forward. Your hands were busy. <laughs> Typing. Oh my god. Typing. Sorry, that's... <laughs> Typing. Well, in 1971, Herb and Juliana got hitched, which, after the very next year, he ended up spending two months in a psychiatric hospital for what he deemed was an outburst over a car problem. Damn. I've seen so many fathers do that exact same thing, though. Honestly, I almost did that myself not too <laughs> recently. I was just like, what's wrong with this car? Why is it now $1,300 when you quoted me 200 when I came in here? Oh, yeah. I was there that day. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I had an outburst, but I didn't have to go to a psychiatric hospital yet. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, after he was released, he got a job at the DMV. <laughs> Honestly... <laughs> Don't people go crazy after they work at the DMV <laughs> and not before they work there? Yeah. I don't know. I kind of feel like that's like, yeah, but the DMV is perfect because the folks at the DMV can do anything they fucking want to you and nobody oh, yeah, can do sure. a thing about it. Like, it's yeah. like, it's like cops without walking. They can just <laughs> fucking whatever the fuck they want to you and you have to go to them. Malicious. Yeah. And honestly, <laughs> this kind of leads in what he did next. So while you're Ouch. saying that <laughs> while working there, he sent a letter to the governor of Indiana. For some reason, it doesn't mention he, why he, he did. Hey, Craig. And he peed <laughs> on the letter. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, I would do that. <laughs> but that... Ew. Yeah, but and they like, caught him doing this, they too. Get the how did how he would get he caught? send a letter? <laughs> I don't know. They just saw him doing it. I guess they had like he he wasn't he wasn't in the bathroom, obviously, or I don't know, maybe he had the Did he like open the, bathroom, the envelope and try to pee inside and then lick it close or something? He, like what the yeah, fuck? Like, did he, but it's sweat. No, he, 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 he peed on the like so like as he was sent about to send the letter, he peed mail. on it. Yellow mail's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Well, he got fired after that stunt, in which what? I would hope that he did. Yeah. And I mean, yes. Bobby. Also, also, this is another little thing that he did too while he was working at the DMV. He sent mm -hmm. out a Christmas card okay. and a picture on the front of the Christmas card. So he's married at this time, right? <laughs> yeah. Married and uh, I think he has a child. So he he sent out the Christmas card Christmas card and it's him and another guy dressed in drag on the front, a picture of that. And to okay, be fair, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah fair, that's, that's actually pretty awesome. Legit. But like yeah. it, it just showed that like especially at this time how he was being viewed as like a just a normal you know heterosexual male like trying to be working in the DMV he he kind of got a just like people looked at him weird like this guy's going a little bit nuts mm -hmm. but I guess he's okay I feel like honestly most of this stuff it's like sometimes this happens with serial killers but they try to make out like you know, aspects of like the, the that are outside of the cultural norm or whatever, mm, at least like yep. the the cultural norm that they would show at eight o'clock on NBC in like the early 2000s, <laughs> you know, like yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, seventh heaven, like anything outside of that. It's just like, whoa, he yeah. tried wacky to backy and it's just like, yeah. and like, yeah, the dude's got a fetish, you know, mm -hmm. um, yep. he's skinny, he's antisocial. Honestly, at this point, he kind of just sounds like half the emo kids I knew in high school. Like, he really yeah. just doesn't sound that far off from, like, football. Oh. Like, you know, he's just yeah. chilling over on the side doing his thing. He's not necessarily, like, you know, kicking ass and, like, getting the best grades in the world. He's kind of, like, average around shit. Yep. And, like, he has a temper issue. And it's just, like, that's, yep. like, a lot of people are like that. So... Yeah, he's not know. he's not horrible right yet. I mean, he's you yeah. know, as we know, already said he's a serial killer. But at this point in the story, he's okay. He's just yeah. like he's fine. 
He's fine. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, if, if to he be would fair, listen to our show. if if you heard <laughs> that your friend sent a letter to the governor and urinated on it when you're young, I mean, he's not super old. I would have, you know, I would have laughed. Like, gave I would have laughed. A high five. <laughs> yeah, right. You, you would have laughed. So thinking about that, it's just like, okay, this is fine. Yeah. Well, throughout the late seventies and early eighties, Herb's behavior started becoming more erratic. Oh. He was arrested for a hit and run, which he caused, and then was almost convicted of insurance fraud, except that he was acquitted after a bench trial. So, like, they had a real quick trial and got, you know, the judge came on the bench and was like, all right, I don't see any evidence for this and mm -hmm. never really got to pass that. Didn't so, stick. Yeah, it didn't stick. And which, honestly, you know, once we come to find out later, he might have tried to. Um, so, who knows? Okay. And around this time, he and Juliana had three children in the early oh. 80s. What? Why do all the serial killers have so many children? I, don't mm. know. I guess they're just trying to be normal. You know, they're trying to do what they think is normal in, in this time to kind of get by. Well, babies know? are really? like really good bait. Like you can yeah. use oh, them yeah, for, for anything. Sure. Just like, yep. oh, oh, thank God you're here, hitchhiker, as I'm driving. I need help with my baby. And they're like, oh, I yeah. guess I have to ride with you. Like, that's how it happens. Everybody yeah, knows sure. that. Yeah. Good and thinking. I mean, at this time, he was also known and by all accounts as an amazing father. And he gave his yeah. kids whatever they needed. He lavished them with extravagant gifts. The most and patient man in the world when it comes to changing diapers. I mean, I've seen him spend hours just getting pissed on and shit on. Never complains. <laughs> yeah, he was te he was he was completely a golden father. You know, yeah. as we uh and we so and funny. <laughs> And we love him for that. He was doing a he was a great father, right? You know, and like that's and a lot of times that's hard to come by. So you know, that's great that he was doing that. And well, at this point, Julianne and Herb decided they would make a kind of a thrift store business. It, Naturally. So in, random, in, but okay. Right? Yeah. In nineteen eighty eight, they started a thrift store called Save a Lot, which basically oh, just received donations and sold them. And if that doesn't sound familiar, it should Goodwill. because that's what Goodwill <laughs> is. Knew it. And yeah. I'm going to freaking derail us for one second because I worked at Goodwill. We don't and accept Goodwill, that at the show. You did? What? Yeah, I worked at Goodwill when I was younger oh, when I lived in Virginia. I can and see Goodwill that. isn't named Goodwill for Goodwill Towards People or Giving oh. or that such crap. Oh. But it's named for the founder who is named Arthur Goodwill. <gasps> they make a lot of money. And while they mm. do give away some of it to help, they do do some good things. Most of it's profit, and they piss me off. Though it's a great place I, to find some awesome clothes when you yeah, need to really, for Yeah, I really so. don't have a price. That's why they, I never they, felt yeah. bad like when I shoplift at Goodwill. And... High five. High five for that. We're, we're, we're air fiving right now. So if you can't see that, we're an audio medium, but me and Beth Spade just air fived because uh, <laughs> thank you for helping me in my quest to bring down Goodwill. And Blasted. if you hate me, you can send it to haters at blackcat.report. <laughs> That's our email. Send it. Again, Gil will read it and yell it at me. I'll get it. I'll, it'll make me smile. Yeah. But I, I do want to say two bombs in two weeks. Last week it was, well, when I was smoking peyote <laughs> this week, it was. It was, and that's why I don't feel bad when I shoplift from Goodwill. <laughs> and that's why we love Betsabe, because she's so open and honest about her crimes. <laughs> I try. I try. Yeah. Well, anyways, back to the story. After their first store did so well, they opened a second one. So <laughs> they basically franchising at this point, and all seemed to be going well in Bowmaster's life. Well, Starting in 1980, there started being a whole lot of missing persons that eventually <laughs> were attributed to her Bowmeister. Man, these what? donations Already? just keep pouring in. Yeah, he's not <laughs> even that far. He's not even into his real point yet. Though, to be fair, they will not officially charge to him. He, okay. he most likely murdered them. So it's here we'll get into a bit of Herb's MO as a serial killer. As we know from the earlier story of his life, he was a happily married man who at times was a bit erratic, but still a lovely family man. He made a lot of trips back and forth from his Save-A-Lot stores and treated his children to everything they could need. Well, creeping on the inside of this man was a horrific and diabolical asshole. So, we all know that still in the 80s, 
The gay population was not listened to nor helped by police or authorities. They were part of the lesser then. And if you didn't know that, then you never researched Jeffrey Dahmer or lived in the 1980s. And I would say that you should research it if you haven't, or you can just watch the dramatized Netflix show Dahmer, which is wonderfully portrayed by Evan Peters. We also do not are not sponsored by Netflix. I just really like but that. But we are sponsored by Evan Peters. Yes, Evan Peters <laughs> does sponsor us. So Evan Peters, yeah. actually, reach. can you reach out to us and so we can get some compensation for yeah, us? Yeah, just check bounced. Yeah, yeah. It, Your yeah, check it, bounced. <laughs> yeah. Well... Anyway, in the period between 1980 and 1991, Herb Bomeister murdered 11 people. Damn. Well, to be fair, most of these people were reported missing, but there was never a connection until afterwards. Yeah. This was the phase of his murders where he was named the I-70 Strangler, <laughs> mm, which is phase one. And I want to say that, well, Herb had a different phases of his murders because, well, he was prolific. For now, we'll just stay at the phase of the I-70 Strangler. Okay. Starting in 1980, Herb began his murders, or at least the possibility of his first murders. There could have been more before. We just don't know. We're just focusing on the ones that he was... They, they're like, okay, this is his MO. This is what he did. It's later found out that a 15-year-old named Michael Sean Petrie was discovered naked in Hamilton County, Indiana on June 16th. Despite Michael being of young age... He was a sex worker and would often ride in the client's cars to wherever they would go do the deed. The coroner's office noted that he was killed by strangulation with no traces of drugs or alcohol. This would be his M.O. He would pick up most of his victims from the local gay bars around Indianapolis, mostly being described as a random mustachioed man. Whoa. Well. Mm-hmm. In 1985, a teenager named Eric Roker disappeared, then was found a few days later, shirtless and in a stream near Preble County, Ohio. So I think he's getting closer to you, Gil. <laughs> I don't know where the hell Preble County is. I think it's near the border of Indianapolis. It's probably not that close to you, honestly. But <laughs> well, no, that that's like right near, yeah. Anyways. Huh? This guy might have been around when you were growing up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I Born in 1990, Joey. Wait, so was he gay? It continues. So, well, yeah, so he was by at least he was bisexual at it's this point. It's a good time to yeah. have this conversation, Betsy Bay. Sometimes people <laughs> can. <laughs> yeah. It was noted like, that he was. He was. Variety. He was <laughs> yeah. People and gender. It was mostly noted that he was bisexual because he had his wife. Um, but what really. But he only liked golden showers from men. Or uh, from his never, wife too. So that's it never they, when went somebody's into, that part into of it. more than one gender, they might, you if know, that's like what you're to into. have different sorts of actions with each one of those. And sometimes women pee. What? I've never seen it, no. but I've heard of it. Yes, <laughs> sounds mythological. But hey, that's what we do here on this show. <laughs> yeah. Going Wait, to your original what, what question. What are we doing this show? <laughs> I have no idea. We take breaks what? to go to the bathroom. But wait, going wait, wait, back I'm to not re- done with my question. I was okay, going to answer so your question. Was he was he also killing women? No, he never killed a woman. Yeah. Also, yeah, I mean, this kind of fits like the whole process. Like you just brought up with like Dahmer and stuff. It's just like it's super easy <laughs> for serial killers to um, develop or for let's put it this way when somebody might be in the early stages of becoming a serial killer. They're just, I guess, a murderer. Um, uh-huh. They might not be able to get to their second victim, third victim, fourth victim, because they're actually murdering people that are a part of a population or a like a social class that the cops pay attention to and like listen yep. to and respond to, and they put money and energy and effort and time and news into it. Killing a bunch of like 14-year-old like, sex workers... Mm-hmm. Out in the middle of fucking nowhere, <laughs> especially at this time, cops aren't going to give a fuck. Yep. Like, <laughs> half the time, those 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds were probably hiding from the cops anyways. The cops might not have even seen them or knew that they were there. And for all the families knew, if the families even did care to look for those kids, right? Um, the kid had gone missing five months earlier, six months earlier. So all of a sudden, it's just like, we find a body... You know, they ask around, they eventually find out like, oh, apparently he's associated with sex work. 
And then eventually they tie it back to the family. And then eventually they hear from the family. But like super difficult to track down a murderer or a serial killer in that situation. Not hard to track down a serial killer when they're like, you know, murdering a 45 year old blonde white lady living in a $900,000 house. <laughs> you know, that'll get the news. So sure. Yeah. Like adding, adding in that they were also gay to yeah. that point of like that, you know, as we looked at Dahmer's part of it is that they just were like, ew, ew, that's, we don't want to deal with that is what the police are thinking, you know? And it's just like, come on guys, you're stupid. Be an idiot. Yeah. You guys are idiots. They're the same as everybody else. Uh, and anyways, diatribe, me and Gil get on sometimes around this kind of crap. But just dealing with the facts of being police work at this time, they actually were looking into this, which is kind of funny. They just didn't have any clues because there was no clues at this time. These bodies were just being found on the side of the road. And there was, no, there was very few witnesses. And also the families of these kids were were I ran to it time and time again reading their uh reading the the victims mm-hmm. um info is that the families were like no they weren't gay they were never gay yeah. they would never go to this uh gay club in Indianapolis and so the detectives researching this are just like well we know that they were there can you give us specific times that or specific places that they go the parents were like no they would never do that so the detectives would get stonewalled in a lot of this being like well now we can't follow up on this because we're being told that this is not part of their life. This is random, even though we kind of have these leads. So it really hurt detectives that actually were trying to do right, right at this time that families also who kind of, some of them kicked out these kids from their house just because they were gay. But again, we're going into a lot of details from the victims in this, which is the victims were the victims. And it's really sad. Um, but going into back into Eric Rutger, um, he had ligature marks around his neck from a rope and a burn on his shoulder, which now we know the MO from from Herb is that he would choke them to death. So yeah. Eric was heading to a few interviews that day for a summer job that he had, and but he did not end up going to any of them. Witness claimed that he was waiting for the bus that day, but ended up accepting a ride from a passing car which later find out was her. So the last one I'm going to describe out of the 11, only going into three here because it's very similar things that they were all just found dead, uh, was a guy, a 42-year-old named Otto Gary Becker, was found in a ditch next to the gravel road in Henry County, Indiana. This murder, however, had two witnesses. They said they saw Otto driving along I-70 with another man driving in a car. However, they could not ID the murderer, and they eventually they got into it where they were talking to the deputies and the uh, detectives and they showed them just a list of suspects that they had and none of them were the suspects for that they recognized. So Herb obviously is nowhere on anybody's radar at this point. He's just a random guy, Randy mustachioed guy coming to the A clubs, just picking up people and taking them out. I mean, I got to say, like, owning a thrift store is probably the best position to be in if you're going to be a serial killer you have yep. access to an unlimited supply of costumes and disguises yep just think about it there's fucking everything there wigs other colored wigs right yeah. smaller wigs you can get any kind of wig yep i right. don't know and, i'm just saying it's brilliant and no he's and it's great like and his he was had a family He's looked on as like a great person in the in the community. Nobody had any idea. His wife didn't have any idea. They all forgot his, he worked for the DMV at some point. They forgot he worked for the DMV. That he was in the had psych evaluations. That he was schizophrenic. That he was in the mental hospital for a little bit. And like it, they all these little things add up to what he would become. So it can't be overstated that this wasn't even in his most recognizable time period. This is his. I-70 strangler period and we don't we we're about to get into the other period of murders in his life which is just crazy that he had two specific complete and utter like different parts of his life so Herb was also not a suspect that even you know anybody would look at they were tributes to him after the fact due to the proximity and his way of killing asphyxiation so we're going to find out that that becomes a new thing that he likes okay yep. All right. So I want to get back fun. to, oh, he sounds fun. He's probably the best person to have at parties. So 
let's get back to Herb and Juliana's life while all of this was happening, right? So they opened two save lots and then had a few kids. And then in 1991, bodies just stopped being found on the side of the road. Just people stop looking Ooh. for them, or no? Did the no, bodies they... have rainbow flags on them, and the cops just ignored them and drove by? Like what? what no, you... they and literally they stopped like... finding them because oh. they were looking, obviously, because there were so many happening at this time, okay. especially because there were other serial killers working in the same time period yeah. in the same road. Pretty so much a tradition. I'll, yeah, I'll get sure. into it later about the other guy that was working, um, the other serial killer in the area. So. The reason this happened was because Herb and Juliana bought a new place, which was called Fox Hollow Farm. Where are they getting all this money from? They, the they two save a lot stores. Yeah. Their, their business was killing yeah. it. See, the trick with the time. title is it doesn't tell you who saves a lot, it's them. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, Fox Hollow Farm was a huge estate that spanned about 18 acres in Westfield, Indiana. The house itself was a 1977 Tudor-style home built on the 18 acres. Yeah. It's like a pretty new house at the time. Yeah, and it's actually a quite beautiful home. And the painting and style kind of looks like the Grove Park Inn with Mm -hmm. like its its like white top underneath its, uh, underneath the the rafters with like brown uh, Mm -hmm. wood style uh, cross beams and a beautiful stone style brick. So it's kind of just... Honestly, just looking at it, I would buy this property. Pretty nice. Yeah. Well, they purchased it from the owner of the home for the price of almost a million dollars, nine hundred and seventy-nine thousand dollars. Which they said at this That's time like was like forty million dollars. <laughs> they said at this time for this property and the house, like the mansion, it's it was like nothing because oh. the. Well, keep going. I'm looking yeah. that up for inflation. <laughs> well, the contract was pretty good for this huge place and a beautiful house. They said they put down a small down payment and would pay the whole house off to the guy they sold the bought it from in five years. Wow, that's awesome. So, so I did some math. Whoa. Yeah. No, that's what's the uh, about about one million dollars in nineteen ninety one is two million two hundred and fifty nine thousand eight hundred and thirty one dollars and thirteen cents. Dang. That's how fucked we've all become in our lifetime. Sorry, go ahead. Over doubled. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, say say they put down like 10K down on the house, right? So which okay. I'm sure they probably put more down, but let's just say they put down 10K. To pay off the house in five years, they would be paying $16,150 a month Damn. on their mortgage. They're making good money. They're making good money. And, and they with were... three kids. Damn. And with three kids, yep. Mm. So they must have been doing really, really well with their stores. Well, we're doing perfect with our budget. It's just... This gas bill for the cause just keeps going up. We don't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this became their home and would be Herb's new workspace. Wait. For a while, Herb was happy and content, as was his family. I their just kids love were going... hanging pictures. <laughs> their kids were going to private schools, and Juliana was helping run the stores. Herb, throughout the 90s, was continuing his murders that originally started in the 80s. But now he was focusing on things a little closer to his home. He's getting older. He doesn't oh. want to go out as much. That makes yeah, sense. It's true. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Know? Yep. Uh, as was said, in 1991, bodies stopped being found on I-70. Mm. And we know that this coincided with the home being bought in 1991. Mm. Also want to add that during the early 80s, the Indiana bar scene was also terrorized by another serial killer. He was known as the highway killer, Larry Eiler. He oh, also Larry. had a similar demographic for who he killed. His demographic was the same, but his method of killing was different. He would use knives and stab his victims instead of strangling them. So he can clearly define the murders from Larry to Herb. Because Larry was also caught in 1983, which was around the time that Herb yeah. started his murder spree as the I-70 Strangler. So there was kind of a clearly a like... <laughs> Uh, a defining moment where Larry Eiler gets caught and then Herb starts, even though they had, you know like what? That's a good years. idea. Yeah. Right. <laughs> even though they're, they're, they were doing different things, they still had the same demographic. Larry Eiler killed. He actually, Larry Eiler killed younger kids though. He killed mm. anywhere from like 12 to Damn. I think 16. Um, there might've been a little older in here, but most of the time Herb was killing anywhere from like 
15 to like 40. So it was just the demographic works were crossing over in like a little Venn diagram. Yeah. Yeah. So it's here in 1991. He would start what was the second phase of his murders? The Fox Hollow Farm killings. So there were nine identifiable bodies found at Fox Hollow Farm. And honestly, they're still identifying people to this day. I just saw an article what? that they ID'd somebody yesterday. Holy shit. No way. They used DNA to find the person. Yep, who it was, the bones. Jesus. I'm going to say a really shocking number and then co- put it in context for you. At the Fox Hollow Farm, when they dug it up, they found over five thousand five hundred no. bones on the property are to you put, kidding me to put that in context there are 206 bones in an adult's body so extrapolating i know gil how many it's probably around 26 people and they identified nine and these are only the bones they found i just love this new gardening hobby you've gotten into herbert <laughs> you're just putting flower beds everywhere uh, yeah i love flowers and that's where the bread came from. Yeah, it looks good on you. <laughs> How did this skinny guy, like, kill people? Well, he was, he just asphyxiated him. And I think a lot of it was- spending all of his time doing sports. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. that was, that's kind of like a sport. It's well, exercise. Strangling is actually quite hard from yeah. watching, you know, like from- if from yeah. what from watching what not experience say, i was gonna say watching <laughs> watching shows watching this shows is, this is gonna Honestly. be a recap of the episode after um our flat earth episode when you had to go yeah. on and be like listen everybody <laughs> I don't actually. okay so watching shows and i know everybody watches murder shows yeah. every time they talk about the guys who are the murderers are like it's actually really hard to strangle somebody and they get tired doing it you know, and sure, so like Joey, Gil sure. knows this too from listening to the last podcast on the left, and they always talk <laughs> about it with the murderers. So, well, during 1993, Herb hit his stride. Five young men and boys went missing throughout 1993 and eventually were found on the farm. Three more went missing in 1994, and another went missing in 1995. There was a, a funny coincidence. They all seem to disappear in the warm summer months. They all went missing April mm. through August. And one thing I asked myself is how does a serial killer hide this from their significant other and kids? Yeah, I when mean, their seriously. kids are home from school. Well, for her specifically, his parents had a condominium in Lake Wawasee in northern Indiana. The lake was two and a half hours north of Indiana and could feasibly be where his family was while he was committing the murders because he liked to take his kids up there. His wife liked to take his kids up there. I know we just got here, but I forgot my car keys at home. Gotta go. Yeah. I imagine (laughs) he would say, I, I, yeah, I imagine he would say that, oh, I can't go. I have work stuff to do. You you know, Juliana, you go ahead and take the kids up. I'll meet you up there, you know? And so his family was away. (laughs) (laughs) I got to go to the Finger Lakes. Um, But he would, he would commit the murders while they were gone. And that was honestly something I kind of extract, yeah. extrapolated from it myself. It's not really something that people thought, but honestly, that's how that he did sense. it. They were gone. Yeah. Yeah. This would allow him the time and ease to lure victims back to his house and then strangle them. Wow. So, look at the really nice brick and you got the wood inlay over there. <laughs> it's just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, it's easy. Like, they co- this looks just like <laughs> there. There's an explanation later about what you know how he got a lot of the people back. So we'll talk about okay. after committing seven murders and burying them at the farm. Herb met a man named Roger Allen Goodlett, who was 33. Roger disappeared after visiting his mother's house and going to a gay bar on 16th Street in Indy. He was also noted later as being seen with Herb a few weeks earlier at the bar as well. So people started noticing and connecting things here, but that was found out later. Well, after his disappearance, his family went to the police to report him missing. Literally the day after he went missing. So like after he went to Herb's house that night from the bar, the you know the, his mom couldn't reach him. So yeah. she was like, well, he's gone. I got to go find him. The police in this part of the story, 
They said, we can't do anything till 30 days after the last day he was seen. <laughs> look, I don't know who you think you're talking to over here, but do I look like a man that has gaydar? I don't. Okay, I can't find him. I can't find yeah. him. No idea where to start. Well, that's pretty much what happened. Yeah, because they just didn't care, and they didn't care either. You know, like they some of the detectives were working on it. The police were just like, I don't because yeah, half shit. of them wanna... also went there after work and didn't want their families to like see the photos of them coming that into the bar be and the so bartender true. being like, "Hey, Steven. <laughs> She's like, "Wait, my name's sure. not Steven. <laughs> I'm even. You know my name is Evan. Star while I'm Evan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Evan, not right. even. Sorry. You're just a little odd. Well, Roger's I think mother. I left my car to you last night. <laughs> Roger's mother, persistent, said this would not do. And she hired a Hell private yeah. investigator to find her son. Smartest move that anybody in the story did. P. The P. private investigator. <laughs> yeah. Well, the private investigator and detective named Mary Wilson met up and started searching for clues, but the trail went cold at almost every turn. Eventually, they found a friend of Roger Goodlett's said that he had met a man in a bar in Indy that might know of a strange individual in the gay bar scene. So, the man was I mean, named- There were so many back then. <laughs> it's, it doesn't, like, honestly, it, it, the way that they found this guy, he was just kind of telling a story to one of the detectives. And the detective was like, wait, wait, ho hold on. Who said what about a weird guy in a bar? <laughs> and then he was like, let's, let's, let's narrow in on that. So they found this guy. And in a lot of stories, he's named, in quotations, the informant. Because really? obviously bef he's not really need to be known, especially if the Herb had other people that were also murdering with him. So, yeah. But and later, it was noted that the man's name was Tony Harris. So Tony was a patron of the bar. He noted a newcomer to the bar who was looking at a missing persons poster of Roger Goodlett. So he takes his home from memory. Yeah, he's like <laughs> looking at this guy and he's like, did you know? Tony asked, did, did you know him? And he's like, no, no. Why did he even act weird there? I'm just saying, like, he could have, like, so easily just been like, I feel like I saw him, or like, he could have came up with a lie so quick, so fast to, like, explain. You're supposed to look at missing persons photos. Like, that's what yeah. they're there for. That's mm -hmm. not weird. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's like you're parked in a parking lot in the middle of the fucking day while everybody's shopping, and they're like, oh, hey, did you just get here? And it's like, I was masturbating for six hours. It's like, Why would you tell yeah. me that? You could have just told me you were getting ready to leave. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> like, yeah, you don't need to tell the truth. Why did he get weird about this? Yeah, he just he just didn't know what to say, I think, at the point, and he made it weird, and that's why Tony mm. also kind of was like, okay, I'm going to note this guy. I'm well, going to remember that stash. Tony also then introduced himself, and Herb introduced himself as a man named Brian Smart. <laughs> <laughs> And so smart. Awesome freak. <laughs> that is an awesome fake name. Yeah, right? <clears throat> yeah. Well, Herb, or Brian, as we'll call him, said that his employer had a pool at his house, and they can go have some fun at the pool. You I mean, who wouldn't want to go to a pool pool party, right? You With know a random stranger. <laughs> I mean, but, like, I can't think of anything more fun than going over to somebody's boss's house. <laughs> Hang out. Yeah, with a cool pool party, Gil. Yeah, that I can make it name cool. a few people that would actually be like, "Oh, you've got a pool." Yeah, Let's yeah. Go. I mean, like, I, why I didn't not? Have, right? I didn't have central air at my house until this year. For so for like the past ten years, I haven't had air conditioning in my house besides like window yeah. units, and I would do some things for pools. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and who knows, you know, yeah. what you have done for pools. I Mostly just pool kind of sneak into hotels, but well, that's also a good way to do it too. Well, yeah. It's fun. It's fun. It's fine. It's a little fine. bit of murder and then just walk right in. It's super easy. It's a <laughs> discount pass. Hmm. Yeah, we don't like to admit to crimes on here. I well, never admitted to you. You don't. Except for me. Except yeah. that's us, but you know, that's fine. It's never that bad. It's never <laughs> that bad, honestly. Anyways, Tony noted that they kept driving and driving and driving and driving and driving and eventually left the downtown of Indy and then kept driving until he pulled up to a mansion, in Tony's words, right? Okay. So, well, 
there was actually a pool at the other end of this trip. So Tony was just okay. kind of like, Bob, this is this is okay. There's actually a pool here. He's not but lying. He was right? found in it. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Sorry. Wait. Jump ahead in the story that didn't even actually happen. So Tony went and got changed into some trunks that uh, mm-hmm. you know, that Brian everybody had has there. a spare on them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And when he came back, Herb or Brian mm-hmm. was already in the pool and ready to chill. They're pooling and chilling. So, as they talked in the pool, Brian brought up coming. That's <laughs> real good with casual conversation. I yeah, know. right. Well, Does he, he basically come. <laughs> <laughs> well, he basically <laughs> said, "Hey, you know what makes coming even better?" <laughs> All right. <laughs> Being choked until almost dying, then coming. Wow. All right. Yep. So this well, episode's rated R. It is rated R. So, well, I'm no David Carradine. Carradine, Aww, dude. Carradine. Aww, I know. But I don't think I would but do this with a stranger. he does dress as Batman and hang out in his closet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Not me, Brian. Um, we are unhinged <laughs> this week, y'all. We've had a lot of rough weeks leading up. We're all tired with very little sleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but y'all, mm-hmm. honestly... We need a lighthearted episode after all the serious episodes we've been having. I, I like that this is a lighthearted <laughs> episode. We're making it a little lighthearted because the serial killer's stupid and funny. Um, well, Herb wrapped a hose around the neck of Tony okay. very tenderly, you know, like not really like a, a murderer would at first. Yeah, so, just, yeah, yeah just, just slowly. And then slowly just started tightening it tighter and tighter. Okay. Until Tony was close to dying. So, so choking works. Smartly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, honestly, when I see people getting in, in like, God damn it, that's the way. Every time, <laughs> every time I watch what? a movie and somebody's getting drowned, I'm always like, why don't you just pretend to drown, pretend to be drowned, and then, like, then try to get up, right? You know, that, I feel like that would be a good defense, right? So Tony Wait, did this. Wait, what does that have to do with me? Because last time you said that I was okay, that I was killing people. <laughs> That's what you meant. So honestly, takes... I would not be surprised. Well, she she takes no accountability for her accusations. <laughs> no. She forgot it she immediately, but it built up out. an insecurity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> until Tony yeah. was close to dying, he <laughs> pretended to pass out and went limp. So Herb let go and stood up. He was like, "Yay, my job's done." <laughs> Time for a popsicle. (laughs) Time for a popsicle. So, much to her surprise, Tony opened his eyes. That was great. Holy (laughs) shit. And then supposedly. You need to pretend. And and then supposedly Tony said, It's you. I'm going to the authorities. And then Herb said, Who's going to believe you? This guy sucks at comebacks. He, he does. He doesn't have good comebacks. Well, honestly, to- I thought like, that was like a great I, comeback. This is like so you. much time involved in a situation. Like somebody just tried to like strangle you to death, and you came out like you came back into consciousness and realized, holy fuck, I'm at the serial killer's house alone with them, and you're like, hey, you, you cut that out. <laughs> I'm going to tell the police. Like, it's just like, bro, just run. You don't need to justify shit. Just fucking run. Get the fuck out of there. Steal the car. Get Go. Like, you don't You don't need to be like, no, I want you to remember this face. And he's like, oh, I will. And you're like, no, that's not what I mean. I want you to remember me when they come for you. <laughs> oh, I'll remember when they come. Oh, no, that's not oh what I mean. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, damn it. <laughs> Pretty much. That's so <laughs> Afterwards... Tony smartly thought, well, to go to the authorities. Smartly. That's my last name. <laughs> I'm oh, wait, going no, to. Oh, shit, never mind. <laughs> that's Sorry, Brian I fucked Smart. That up. No, he's Damn the it. other one. <laughs> I'm going to actually have to live oh. through this to tell on this guy. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and I'm at his house. I have no car. I'm basically in my trousers. This guy's got me in a pool. And I, on, I don't have any evidence that he really did this. And really, who is going to mm-hmm. believe me? But exactly. he still thought, like, I have to get out of here. And I have to Obviously. be okay. Yeah. I have yeah. to be okay. So he just started, they just started drinking. And he was what just like, kind of pretended like it didn't happen. And then they kept drinking and partying. And eventually, Herb or Brian passed out. 
Okay. He was drunk, so he's okay. just like, oh, he passed out. So Tony's like, okay, this, yeah, a drinking competition. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's so, what it happened. Yeah, pretty much. And so the next day, Herb was like, okay, like I, he's, he's just like, nobody's gonna believe this guy. I and his you car st- hangover, Herb. I mean, Brian. Yeah. yeah. Bet you had yeah. aspirin too. Maybe we have to mm, take a ride into town to the Red Egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be I, the Red Egg. Head that way. I, Need a new shovel, anyways. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, let's just take a little ride into town to the Rite Aid. <laughs> to the Rite Aid. So you know, Herb also noticed that his Tony left his car back at the bar, right? Because he they drove out together in the same car. Yeah. Which I do want to say, Tony actually was smart because Herb tried to get him to drive his car out too, so there would not be a car left at the bar. Mm. So if his car wasn't left there, there would be nobody knowing that he was gone out with somebody else thought he would go home so tony was smart in that he left the car at the bar hey just because Even, i'm going home doesn't mean my car has to let's right? go yep you can't what what's the quote uh you can't go home but your car has to stay here so i don't know it's a new quote i'm making up so cool. well dmv themed yeah it's, <laughs> it's a dmv themed episode yep so okay. after tony was driven back to his car herb dropped him off no big deal. <laughs> Tony then was like, I'm going to the police. Now I'm going to the police. Oh, the yeah. bar's open. <laughs> Literally, oh, the bar's open. <laughs> no, uh, go have another drink. No, he to went straight to the police. Pop. Okay. Yep. And and the the private investigator. So the the they both interviewed Tony. He described the land. He couldn't exactly remember how they got there and like where it was, but he described the land and that was a beautiful mansion in his words. Okay. Sadly. Oh. The private investigator and the detective, they looked in the area, but they couldn't find this is the Indianapolis. Place. It's impossible that there's beautiful land. It must have been another <laughs> state. It must, he must have, have been have knocked him else. out and drove him out of the state. Yeah. Maybe the country. Yeah. And they never, they never, they didn't find him. So okay. they're like, okay, well, they basically were like, hey, if he comes back, like, keep your eye out. You know, we know yeah. you, you, like, you like to go to this bar, same bar. It's like your bar, your, your patron here. Keep an eye out for this guy. And when you do, Find him. Get his license plate. Mm. Smart mm. thing. So, a year passed after uh, Tony was strang- it was almost killed and you know strangulated. Yeah, would like to say it's a new word I made up. Um, okay. And Herb went back to the same bar he met Tony in. Tony mm-hmm. saw him, and then got his license plate finally. Gotcha, bitch. Yep. Yeah, he didn't want to be seen by by uh, Herb either because he knew that the jig would be up and he would you know, be gone super quick. So he wasn't seen by Herb. Got the license plate, mm-hmm. sent it to the PI and the detective. They traced the the vehicle back to Herb, and now they finally had their suspect. Damn. Well, to be fair, they really didn't have any evidence. Just the yeah. word of Tony. So now and they the finally suspicion. have. A suspect. Yes, they finally have a suspect. Just basically on the word of Tony and the suspicion that he was the murderer of most of these people because they were slowly putting it together that all these people, obviously as they should have, were murdered in the same way, same area, and they were going missing from similar bars and same MO. So it's like they're kind of slowly putting this together thinking that it's, we have a serial killer, ladies and gentlemen. So it's like, okay, cool. Like, let's find this guy. Um, so the detective was like, I am going to go and just ask this guy. I'm just, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just, I'm going to fucking go there. I'm just fucking go. I'm not going to yeah. wait. I'm not going to yeah. fucking wait. I'm going right now. It's like, sir, sir, shouldn't we have like backup or like multiple witnesses so that we can hold this up? And no, that, you know, how hard I've been working on this case. Like literally I've just been chilling at home watching ESPN all the time. I've been working so hard on this case for <laughs> years and I need that bonus. It's like, all right. I mean, if you're going to just head out there. He, he left. I haven't even given him the address. Uh, yeah, he's just driving now. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So Mary Wilson, who was the detective, she went to Herb's Save-A-Lot store to question him. Oh, at yeah. work. Yeah, right? She got him at work. So the receptionist was like, or the person working at the uh, the cashier off cashier place was like, hey, he's in the back. You want me to get him? She's like, please go get him. I need to talk to him. Well, the detective straight away asked, have you ever visited a gay bar? <laughs> like, I just out loud in the store. Right And to the Herb's point. like, 
No, no, obviously not. Well, she then was like, look, we have your license plate. We have this guy saying you were there. We know you were there. And so eventually he was just like, okay, yes, I have been to a gay bar, but my wife doesn't really know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's she's like, I, I, I've been to one, but I can't really, you know, I have a family. Please don't like yeah. be, you know, like that. And then she literally right after that was like, I want to search your property. Can I search your property? And I was like, no. <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> Damn. No, His you cannot search my property. His last brain sparked, and he's like, I can, I can say no. Yeah. <laughs> like, <what the? laughs> it, it, was so, it was just so weird. Like, the detective kind of, like, shot herself by being like, can you, yeah. like, right away doing this instead of, like, I'm slowly. Saying. Yeah, it was just kind of like, gonna go. I'm going to go now. I'm just like, shouldn't we, like, get warrants and plan this and get witnesses and a team? Like, fuck that. That's me as a cop. Yeah, like, yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny is that her gave her the number of his lawyer who he said was his lawyer and so the detective was like okay I'll call the lawyer the Brian lawyer was Spot, like well it's at law here <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> they called the law firm and they're like well we don't have any client named <laughs> named Herbert <laughs> and they're, they're, she's like Brian well, no. <laughs> yeah yeah we got a Brian though but so she's like, what do you mean? Just like, yeah, we don't have any retainers or anything for Bri- for Bryce. Sorry, you got me saying Brian already. <laughs> for again. Herbert. Yep. And so she was like, okay. So she goes back to Herbert and Herbert's like, no, just call my lawyer and gave him the number. And at, at this time, oh they my were basically God, like, so funny. Not, yeah, that was a one, like a, not a seven. What are you doing? Of course you couldn't get a hold of him. <laughs> And it was the same yeah. law firm, but uh, uh, bef- but they did this another time, and she went back again, and then he finally, the third time, they were like, he wired the the law law firm a retainer, so that finally they answered the phone, and she's like, can I? She asked the law firm like, oh oh, now you're representing him. Can I search the? Can I search the property? And the, the law firm just goes, nope, and hung up. Oh my God, this is this is not. <laughs> All right, Pets, man, take everything back that I said about how serial killers get away with shit earlier. <laughs> this is not a story about um, catching a serial killer. This is a story about the, what, 11 years, 12 years that were spent ignoring obvious signs. Like, there's, I'm sure there are so many hidden gems here. Like, mm-hmm. literally, like, just, like, save more little vests that are left next to them, old <laughs> license plates, like, yeah. just DNA evidence everywhere in the form of pee. Like, there's just so much <laughs> evidence. They're just like, damn it, we can't find a fucking thing. I think yeah. it's in ditches, sir. What do you mean? Like, I'm developing a theory. You know how we always find them next to ditches? Yes. What if the ditches come out at night and we kill them? <laughs> 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 It's the ditch's fault. We got to get out of here. That's why all the killers are named after roads. Fuck, yeah. he's right. <laughs> We're going to go back to the precinct. We got to meet me at the we bar, gotta, gentlemen. We got to chase the serial <laughs> Meet me at the bar. <laughs> we got to talk to Brian Smart. He's the only one that knows what's going on. <laughs> well, oh, you guys. Now, <laughs> the detectives were pretty much stonewalled. There's nothing really they could do because they just already <laughs> they were used to they, they yeah, and they used to it. And they they shot it already. They were just like they went out and told basically told this guy they were investigating. Eleven so, years on the force. <laughs> yeah. All these eleven years of experience. You've only been investigating one guy I know. <laughs> the PI was also like, Why did you do that? <laughs> He's just like, I've been doing this for so long. Why did you do that? And it was just so funny to like hear about the guy just being like, oh, okay. Well, this is fine. I'm just going to have I'm to not... do harder work. What was her name? Her name was Mary. Mary Wilson. You got me. My name's not Mary Wilson. It's wig <laughs> off. <laughs> it's Brian Smart. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yep. <laughs> Again, wigs. That that was the fucking. Tra- that, that this makes a lot of sense. Yep. No right. wonder the detective can never catch him, because they were never in the same place at the same time. And they never I were see. ever again. So I knew it. Herb told his wife when she asked about why there was police being investigating and stuff, and he basically was just like, "Well, there was a disgruntled employee that was harassing me." 
Oh my god. And that's god. why I was being investigated. Mm-hmm. And at this point, you know, it, it's not, you know, I can I can see why she'd believe him. He's still the same guy. He hasn't yeah. changed, you know, from what he was. There was no weird moods, there was no weird things happening besides the few things that happened earlier, but it seemed like he had turned a corner. He was on the straight and narrow. He was just like Getting very into much gardening. Yeah, gardening and uh they were loving their new house. Well, that was about to be almost flipped upside down. In the winter of 1985, Herb's son found a skeleton in the woods under the brush. What? So not it's buried. Halloween? I want to. I want to reiterate: not buried, just in the woods around their house. Like a kid normally does, he put a stick in the skull and scared scared his sister and was like <laughs> waving it around back at the house. Oh my god! I would have done that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and so the kid was just like, ah, look at it, it's a skull. And it's just like, ah. and so then, you know, he's obviously playing with it. And, you know, Juliana's like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> where did you find that? And uh, yeah, let, can you show me where you found that? And so, you know, the son is like, goes like, okay, let's go, mom. And like takes her to the woods. Officer. I found the strangler. <laughs> yeah, at I found the strangler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, she's just like, take me to him. So take me to the, the body. So the son no. takes him to the woods. <laughs> no. The the son goes to the woods and is like, okay, here's where it is. And so she's like, okay, that's weird. Yeah. That how there's do you a respond skeleton here. That? She's like, that's a skeleton in our woods. So she's like, okay, cool. She, you know, she still takes the skull back. And she wait, she's like, okay, I got to ask Herb what this is. Mm-hmm. Found the funniest thing today. Your son found the funniest thing. Yeah, oh, pretty much. So... We were out in the woods, see? <laughs> in the woods, see? We're out in the woods, see? So he basically told her that it was one of his father's old anatomical skeletons from his practice. What the fuck? Laying As an in the woods. anesthesiologist? Yes. Why would he? That doesn't make any sense. That's so funny, though. I mean, you can use that excuse for like, yeah, that's why I've got this huge collection of morphine. That's a legitimate excuse. It's like, it's from my dad's practice. He could have just been like, someone dropped that off as a donation. Oh, that old thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah he so, could have also just said I don't know I know yeah a very like, simple oh, answer no. oh my god I don't you know, know like very simple <laughs> <laughs> yeah he also after he said that he was like don't worry I just keep these things you know I'm like a pack rat sometimes and I'll, <laughs> it'll be moved soon what and so Juliana, knowing her husband, you was like, hey, he's a little bit flesh on it. He's a little bit quorky. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. a. <laughs> hey, it's been out there for 12 years. It's out there 12 years. So they they basically, she was like, okay, he's a little quirky. I know that. It's it's fine. Like, it, it'll be moved. So, like, she went out a week later and she was like, okay, there's no bones here. It's fine. You got a and, week. Yeah, <laughs> literally. And so she went out there, checked. There was, the bones weren't there anymore. She's like, okay, guess it's fine. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, right? Yeah, okay. It's out of sight, out of mind is what they say. So goes in the bedroom. It's already tucked into bed next to me. Oh, hey, honey. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. Yep. Talk about getting boned in bed. Oh. So wow. as the de- oh. <laughs> Well, one. as the detective was running out of options, obviously, <laughs> the detective decided... Uh, the other thing didn't work. It so would have now been let's... so easy if they could have searched the first time. They would have literally found a fucking skeleton they on the They would have stumbled across it all. So the detective was like, let's go talk to Juliana. Let's go talk to his wife and see if we can find something out. Oh and my she God. did the same thing and asked Juliana if she could search the property. You ever been to a gay bar? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, Who was that? No. She didn't mention any of that, obviously. She just literally asked straight away if she could search the property. And Juliana said, uh, we have been married for 25 years and that he's never even so much as put a bruise on me, even by accident. Get some what proof and then I'll do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, like literally, like you guys don't have a warrant. Why are you coming at me like Wait. this? I don't even know who you are. So whatever. So yeah. it was it's just weird. So Juliana that night obviously went back to Herb and was like, hey, you know, like uh, the police came and asked me some questions, wanted mm-hmm. to search. And he again said like, oh, no, it was just a disgruntled employee. You know, they're mm-hmm. investigating that stuff. Well, at this time, things started going bad for the family. Oh. The business started doing really bad and the bills started going unpaid. Her basically wiped out all the savings and the accounts they had and they had Hard to analysis. he just randomly closed one of the stores. So like Damn. just randomly and she's like what are you what are you doing? And so Herb eventually had to like she was basically like you got to move out we're you know we're separating right now. So Herb oh. moved out of Damn. the house and into the three car garage they had at the house which was used as the get house, guest house. So I want to say they're yeah. paying about $16,000 a month in mortgage. So Damn. I would say that they had two thrift stores. And yeah, their, their yeah. business might be doing good. But if there was a slight downtick at any time, they would not be able to afford this house. Really? He was just killing all those people to save money on clothes to sell at the store. That's how That's, he got the donations. Oh, they Forcible did Forcible donations. How come y'all only ever have like... A- Boys medium to large here. What's what's up with that? <laughs> That's a big seller. <laughs> People would kill for this. Bye. Well, they eventually filed for divorce. Oh, Juliana was getting more and more <laughs> weirded out by her. <laughs> well, now that I think about it, yeah, now that I think about it, it oh one God. weekend Herb left to take their son to his parents' condo in Lake Wawasee. Basically, they'd go there whenever during the summer just to kind of get away from it. Yeah. Juliana this time called her lawyer and her lawyer said, I think it's time you allow the detectives to search the property. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because of all, (laughs) it's been so long, but they're just sitting there like, okay, like I think it's time that, you know, if you're feeling these weird things, (laughs) yeah, it's the same lawyer. He just keeps calling and confessing shit. We don't, we aren't even asking him to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, she allowed them to search the properties, and mm-hmm. they sent for a forensic anthropologist. Basically, he was like, "Okay, you know, you saw bones here, right? You know, the son found the bones." And mm-hmm. she's like, "Hey, we need somebody to look at this because I, they might be human bones." And the forensic anthropologist literally looked at it for one second and was like, "Them's human bones. <laughs> they were also recently just put there." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh, it's fresh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that bone dust. So, <laughs> the detectives were then sent to pick up her son from Herbert because she's like, I don't think that my son should be with this guy. <laughs> Why wouldn't they just call the local police and have the local police drive five minutes down the road and get him instead of driving hours away? Well, because they didn't know what was going on. They also <laughs> had local police with them. No, I mean, why didn't they just call up to the cabin or the house or whatever and they were like, or that area and be like, hey, you know, da 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 da, this is a situation, send some cops out there. It's like a two and a half hour drive. Well, it's also because there's no. There's I, I don't no, know why I'm trying to all of a sudden jump in with like, the, hey, the this would have made yeah, sense. This made like, I'm sense. sorry. I'm sorry. I no, forgot who we were talking about here. None of this made no. sense. So they drove up there also because there's no official reason to why they can, because there's still no evidence that he well, did Well, then this. what are they going to. Never mind. Sorry. I don't know they why. Basically, I, just, I took a turn. And finally, the humor wore off, and I'm just like, God, these people are fucking stupid. Yeah. Well, as soon as the detectives and local police showed up to his Give house, he no. was just like, Damn it. <laughs> fuck. And he, he knew, you know, whether they found anything on the lawn or not, he knew and, and had any evidence. He knew that, like, I got to go, mm. you know. But and I want to say this because, like, laws are written in certain ways and for good and bad. But I want to say because the way that the law was set up, and there, that there wasn't enough evidence to convict Herb. The detectives were afraid that Herb's lawyer would ask for a speedy trial, which meant that the trial would have to be set up in 70 days and would not give them enough time to gather the evidence, right? So even though this looks like the most open and shut case of all time, Just it was 12 all years. still circumstantial. 
literally they could not not prove that he did this and it, it i don't know i i get angry at stuff like this because it's like god you had 12 years you had so long to find clues you had you, so time to plan you had to time plan to plan to like come in with a warrant you literally... and then actually look through the place and find potentially 20, 30, 40 bodies everywhere. You found the bones. Immediately. You know? I'm yeah. just saying, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's, that's promising. There might be more. And guess what? That's going to open up enough of a case with the judge to be like, yeah, you probably shouldn't go look at this property. Yep. <laughs> and then he turns around and takes off his wig. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Brian Dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Herb, again, want to say smartly, <laughs> had not buried the bodies. As I said earlier, the, the bodies- roof. Nobody looks up. <laughs> <laughs> the bodies were left to decompose on the ground. And then oh. after that, he poured <laughs> gasoline on them and burned them. Nothing about that is smart. It's actually smarter because they couldn't, they decomposed. They lost all of the flesh, so they couldn't see that there was ligature marks on the dead bodies. Jesus they couldn't, Christ. They couldn't get any DNA off of them but because like how they literally. How many months is that just a body smelling literally like a dead body well, you have to in think the woods on your own property? There's 18 acres on this. That's a lot. Yeah, I know, to go I know that's big, but like. Basically, like the Billmore. No, mm. the Biltmore is Biltmore's way like bigger thousands than that. of acres. Yeah, oh. yeah. No, yeah. eighteen acres so, is a lot. But I'm just saying. Again, I don't know why I'm trying to throw in common sense at any point in this fucking story. I should have <laughs> yeah. known five seconds in. But like, you're still leaving. Okay, my only comparison to this here, Betsy, judge me for it, is like <laughs> when I was like freshman to I guess junior year in high school. I was growing weed on this like small patch of land that like my family didn't technically own. It just kind of butted up against our house, but like it was basically our property. It was overgrown. So it's not legally tied to us. I was paranoid the whole fucking summer and into the fall because the whole time, you know, somebody looks out the window in the right way or the leaves blow like this or da 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 da. Like something that could get you in trouble is right the fuck over there. Yep. Like it, it you know, brought me paranoia constantly. Like 50 fucking bodies just laying around your property. Uh And this dude's like, save more money, save more. (laughs) I'm just like going along with life. So happy. It's like going up to my parents' place this weekend again. Like, it's insane. To see the duality, too. And you have little kids, too. Yeah. You guys need to stop playing video. I mean, no, keep playing video games. You're not allowed to go outside. Don't look out the window. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Don't look out the window for the next three days. (laughs) <laughs> that and well, bitches. Mm, that's what they found. They well, they also well, you know, as we're saying, they found fifty five hundred bones Jesus. in the property. So, <laughs> a couple thousand of the bones. It's, it's still like so crazy to me. A couple thousand bones were just laying in the woods, like just leave left them all out. You know, and yeah. Animals obviously over time had ripped at the skins, ripped at the clothes, and just, like, moved them this way and that. So, you know, a lot of bones weren't really together the whole time. I grew up not far from there. I grew up northwest Ohio. Like, kind of, you know, like, meh. Geographically, climate-wise, and shit, very similar. There aren't any big predators out there to do that. Even the scavengers, like, that shit would take forever. Mm-hmm. For fucking, I mean, there might be some, like, coyotes and stuff out there. I don't even know if somebody writes somebody and tells somebody and then have them tell us do coyotes even, like, fuck with, like, dead humans? I feel like that's, I don't know. I feel like across the board, humans are known for tasting like shit, and we just don't, a lot of animals yeah. actually don't like eating us, but I don't know. I just don't know what the hell would have helped it decompose fast. That's what I'm saying. Like, that shit was out there for a long pigs. time. Pigs. You need the pigs for that. Yeah. Yeah. Like a I peewee mean, Gaskins, you know what I'm saying? He had it. Yes. He had them. He had, he was um, smart. what was it, Creed? Or um, Nickelback. Uh, it was Nickel- Nickelback that band. played at his. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Nickelback played there. Motorcycle gangs. You know, he knew how to run a serial killer operation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the most interesting part of this to me mm-hmm. is there was a creek on his property as well. And that's where most all of the bones were laying themselves already. So they found a couple more thousand bones in the creek. And I want to say that there is a theory behind why this happens right so the theory behind all the bones laid out is that 
the creek is originally where he started stashing the first bones and bodies. Mm-hmm. And that was farther away from his house, right? And slowly over time, they got closer to the house because he just got lazier, you know? Yeah. After a long time of killing, serial killers start to get lazier and lazier. I think yeah. there's a quote that Ted Bundy said best. It's like changing a tire. The first time you're careful, by the 30th time, you can't remember where you left the lug wrench. And I thought that was such a great quote for this because over time, bodies just get closer and closer and closer to I the house. I think it was weird that you got that like put on you as a tattoo. But yes, it is a great quote, Joey. <laughs> People have gotten worse quotes on their bodies, so. Yeah. His comebacks are getting worse. I'm getting suspicious. <laughs> I, this is what I've been saying. I would not be surprised. Well, I mean, I do help run a murder podcast and hey. true crime, and, you know, sometimes you have to eventually create content, guys, okay? <laughs> well, you're crushing Dale. it. You're crushing it. Now, Why do you <laughs> think I'm here? Alibis? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. The story it came out on Sunday. So it's obviously me. I was recording Stay all day home. Sunday. <laughs> we didn't record it ahead of time. What time did Sunday. you say it happened? Ah, well, we were recording then. We were recording it. <laughs> they would never know. Well, after the detectives and the researchers found all the bones and the story the story was leaked to the news media. And like, oh, this is, is like right as it happens. So Herb's sitting in the condo without, you know, the, the detectives just came and took the kids and he's just like, oh shit. Yeah. He's so, seeing all these bones being found on this property, his property, him and his wife's property. And he's just like, I think it's time to leave. Mm. Herb took his car and fled. But he fled, obviously. North, because that's the closest way he can get. He's not going to Mexico. He's yeah. going to Canada. He stopped right before he got over the border and asked his brother to wire him some money. <laughs> Wait, say is... with the with the accent. Uh, I don't know what you want me to say. Canadian accent. No. Do you, do you, a, a. No. What? A moose is a security guard. No. What are you? What, what Dale, are you asking, Betsabe? I'm asking Joe to do with the accent. What? From the show. From Anyways. The show. <laughs> Wire me the money. Oh, oh, <laughs> yes. Wire me it. the money. <laughs> yeah, it's from uh, Anna Delvey story. It's the Anna Delvey Delvi story that was on Netflix. So how, again, how, another we Netflix do show. An episode. On Anna Delvey? Yeah. Yeah, that would be, so that would be interesting. Was She's, there a reason yeah. why he couldn't just go into Canada and get the money wired to him? I think he just called over the because he didn't want Wait anybody to follow him into Canada. Well, because they, they don't have real calls. money in Canada. I gotta get it because they <laughs> they trace these calls, so they knew that it could have traced the call to him. So they didn't want. I don't think he, he was thinking into that. I don't know. Well, he made it into Canada because Which, obviously he, he walk wasn't... across back then. Yeah, 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 yeah. He can walk backwards. So mm. it was noted that he was eventually seen by a Mountie who told him he couldn't sleep there because he was sleeping underneath the bridge and and because he was in his car and he didn't have anywhere else to go. So he slept underneath the bridge and a Mountie comes up and is like, hey, you can't sleep there. And so- There's been bears in the area. And he's like, yeah. you Canadians are very rude. And he's like, please leave, Canadians. And he's like, you're in our turf. Get out of here. So the Mountie noted that there was an obscene amount of videotapes in the back of his car. Weird. So, it was also never known what was Can you on them. Quantify that for me. Was Obviously, like 12? porn. A hundred. Damn. In his car. Okay. And so uh, th- the the author really made it known that the he second, left. The second he got to Canada, the first cop that comes along spots something suspicious. And what is that suspicion? A large number of videotapes. That <laughs> was enough for them to take action. Meanwhile, <laughs> down yeah. in Indianapolis, can we come on your farm yet? No. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> oh, there's bones there. Oh, we found we'll some bones earlier. I don't care. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Again, well, it's it w- Indianapolis. Yep, it's Indy. So Indianapolis. It was, yep. It was Your never police. known what was on the tapes because they never found the tapes, which is super weird. Um, what what has been suspected? <laughs> is that he taped 
the all his murders. Sleepy he taped out. Or porn. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, to him, that's just one and the same. It's true. You know? Well, he arrived in Ontario, and, you know, he's just sitting there thinking about what he's done, and so he's like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to end it. Just and he wrote his... over at some, like, garden hose that's wrapped up hanging on the wall. <laughs> 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 yeah. Good times. <laughs> In the arms yeah, of an ball. angel. Oh, no. oh. So oh, he God. wrote a suicide note. And, cute. and in the suicide note, <laughs> cute. The final come. <laughs> the final come down. So da -da -da -da, he apologized for the financial ruin that he put upon the family. I'm sorry. So <laughs> he never <laughs> mentioned all the people he murdered. <laughs> He just said he said he really apologized for the for ruining the family and all the financial ruin because he he drained all their bank accounts. And Damn. then in the letter, he wanted to point out specifically that he only put one bullet in the gun. Just one. Because just one. Just one because if a child found the gun oh my God. after he killed himself, he didn't want the child to hurt himself. And uh, first so off, thoughtful. if this child saw the gun in the guy before, the child's going to have way more messed up feelings he than just the about, gun. He thinks about that, but not all the bones that are in the yard that his kids are playing in. <laughs> what the fuck? Yep. Or the families that he ruined. Yeah, yeah. or that, you know. Yep. Yeah. He could really just only afford one bullet at the time, and yeah, he's like, "Oh, basically. probably." Damn yeah. it! How do I, how do I put that in here? Because they're gonna, the wonder, they're gonna be like, oh, "I only got one bullet." He must have only had one bullet in the gun. This guy was fucking broke. Hey, we got a loser over here, and he's mm -hmm. like, "No, I could have totally bought more, but um, the store was out, and I also love kids. Yes, I love kids very much in a totally legitimate way, and <laughs> I don't want them to find the extra bullets or the gun, which is why after I shoot myself." I will eat the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. And then at the end of the note, he was just like, he made this whole diatribe about being like, and the fucking banks, and they didn't get the wire, the money. <laughs> Sorry, another Anna Delvey quote. If you guys watch it, great, great show. She was interesting she was, character. She was a genius in comparison to this guy. She was ahead of her time. Yeah. Well, the last thing at the end of his note was... In quote, I'm going to eat a peanut butter sandwich and oh, then go Joey. to sleep. <laughs> oh my God. That's why you like peanut butter this sandwiches. Is... <laughs> I am having. They are pretty good. <laughs> I am yeah, I I'm a huge peanut butter weird. sandwich fan. I think he likes I'm jelly, huge, though. I don't. Peanut butter know. sandwich fan? Yep. You and me? Mm -hmm. No, Steve? it's just peanut Fuck butter. Yes. Joey only I don't like jelly. peanut butter. Yeah. Okay, sandwich. whatever. And lettuce is just fucking leaves. Whatever. I don't get your point. Point. <laughs> what? I'm just this. All right. You know, like as this, as this, this portion of the story is like kind of closing up, right? As he uh -huh. kind of like opened up there. Um, like I'm feeling bad for all. Well, I'm not fully feeling bad for making fun. I'm feeling bad a little bit for making fun of him because it just seems like there was a lot of lead in the water in this area and that nobody ever found it. That's honestly kind of what it seems like. It like there's a lot of paint eating, um, you know, just um, nepotism in the local mm. police department. Uh, it, it seems to be some other issues going on in Indy. I'm not yep. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they pretty much went from serial killer to serial killer, literally in the same town, the same road, who yeah. had this almost the same demographic of people. With just a different, you know, different style of killing. So they kind of, I I remember we talked. I think it was me and you, Gil. We talked about the lead based theory of yeah. like serial killers, you know, murdering just because a lot of lead. And you know, I'd heard that from somewhere else. So it wasn't just my theory. It was kind of something that I'd heard talked about. So I kind of, I, I kind of help. I kind of think it did help a lot. Yeah. Um, well, he put the gun barrel to his forehead. And boom, it was all over. Boom, boom, boom. He committed suicide without, don't <laughs> say all. It's glad he did this, honestly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but he didn't get justice and he never gave justice to the families, which is kind of the sad thing. He got the thing. easy way out. Yep. He committed suicide without acknowledging any of the murders or bad things he had done 
All he wanted to apologize for was spending all the family's money. They were never actually able to pin these murders on Herb or the murders for I-70 Strangler on him, but there were literally no other suspects. Well, that's not surprising. Yeah, right? And the amount on the bones on the farm say that there was way more than nine people's bodies. I think we you know, figured out it was could be more closer to 26. There might be more than than that. Who knows? And they're still finding people as of yesterday. So, yeah, <laughs> I just saw an article about that when I was researching this. And what is sad is that, you know, that they're using DNA now to find who these people are. And there was a cool thing at, you know, it's it's kind of cool when I heard about it that the actual indie office, I think they said it was around like $1,500 to do a DNA test to see if you could find missing people, right? So they test the DNA of the missing person or the the body that they found with the family's DNA. So like yeah. the mother would give DNA, right? Yeah. And it's $1,500 to do this test, right? Okay. Huh. A lot of people can't afford $1,500, even if they're looking for this. I'm not <laughs> going to feel sorry for this police department. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well... Actually, let's help out because the the prosecutor's office actually got so many donations and put a lot of money into it to lower the price. So okay. they got it down to six hundred bucks. And that's like, like a new year six hundred. Yeah. And and you know, like it does cost money to do this, so I understand. Yeah, of course. But the way that they did that was just like I'm that was great. And so those nine people were helped be ID'd because the prosecuting office helped do this. And it was just very, it was good to see that because obviously otherwise a lot of people aren't going to be ID'd and a lot of people's yeah. families aren't going to have closure that this person murdered them. And so sadly ends the story of Herbert Bomeister. But it does not end our story. We will be getting into more haunting things next week dealing with the actual property, Fox Hollow Farm. And the murders that Herbert Bowmeister committed. So come back next week for some ghoulish tales as we prepare for Halloween. Thank you so much for listening to the Black Cat Report in our episode 68 on Herbert Bowmeister and Fox Hollow Farm Part 1. We'll have Part 2 airing next week. Also, don't forget to send us your spooky, ghoulish stories for our special Halloween episode. And rate us on Apple Podcasts because it helps a ton. And then we'll see you on the other side.